Dr. Leroy Chadwick stood over the woman's body, crumpled, unmoving, unconscious, on the floor of a brothel on the west side of Cleveland. Why Dr. Chadwick was in the brothel in the first place isn't clear. Accounts vary. Maybe it was for the obvious reason. But Dr. Chadwick was a man with a reputation to protect. An old money pedigree from one of Cleveland's oldest families. Surely he knew better than to risk becoming the talk of his neighbors on Euclid Avenue, the so-called Millionaire's Row, which counted among its residents relatives of John Rockefeller, a United States Senator, a former personal secretary to Abraham Lincoln, and whatever other various industrialists and socialites and heirs and heiresses made up a society's upper crust in 1887. Dr. Chadwick was a long way from home now, in more ways than one, with an unconscious woman at his feet on the shabby carpet, in a fog of dim lighting and cheap perfume and scented talcum. We don't know why Dr. Chadwick was there that day, not for sure anyway, but we know who the woman was. Cassie Hoover, late thirties, slightly built, the madam of the brothel, and we know the reason she was unconscious on the floor, and that reason was Dr. Leroy Chadwick, something he had done that day, or so it was meant to seem. In truth, Cassie Hoover had put herself there. She had listed her business in the Cleveland City Directory as a boarding house for young women, but when Dr. Chadwick told her that the establishment was well known for its real purpose, she pretended to faint from the shock of being so scandalized. And when Dr. Chadwick revived her, Cassie Hoover asked him to take her away from the house, lest anyone think that she was complicit in its operation. Which he did, and Cassie Hoover knew that the doctor was recently widowed. Some accounts say that on that day she had given him a compassionate massage, whatever that's supposed to mean, to treat his grief and his advancing rheumatism. Before and after the incident, she maintained that she was a widow from a wealthy New York family. A short time later, Cassie Hoover became Mrs. Dr. Leroy Chadwick. All according to plan. Cassie Chadwick would be just the latest of many names she had used throughout her life. And later she would be given yet another name. In the newspaper society pages, and among the neighbors and shopkeepers and friends and lookers-on who profited from her lavish spending, she would become known as the Queen of Ohio. Conning her way into high society was only the latest of many deceptions in a life of crime, and it wouldn't be her last, or her biggest. No, that was yet to come, and in spectacular fashion. When a magician appears to make an object float, the secret is never farther away than an invisible thread or hidden wire or some other form of unseen support. But somehow, it's still convincing, tricking our senses into believing we're seeing the impossible. Because an illusion doesn't result from the mere mechanical means of deception, but rather from creating a reality that supports it. The con artist works in a similar fashion. We shake our heads in sympathy and amusement and disbelief when we hear stories of what some scoundrels have been able to convince people of, of the realities they were able to create that allowed for their cheap tricks and outrageous lies. Like the story of a man who sold the Eiffel Tower to a scrap metal dealer in the 1920s. Or of the man who stole a doctor's credentials and performed numerous surgeries aboard a Canadian naval ship during the Korean War. Or of Cassie Chadwick and the $20 million deception that made her a media sensation, that brought down a bank, that landed one man in jail and caused another to die of a broken heart that involved one of the wealthiest men the world had ever known, but whose name no one dared speak until it was all much too late. I'm Brian Earle, and this is Illusion. Cassie Chadwick was born as Elizabeth Bigley in Canada in 1857, a farm girl who had fallen ill as a child and lost part of her hearing. And when she spoke at all, it was with a slight lisp. She was prone to long bouts of daydreaming and keeping to herself. But sometime in her early teens, she became fascinated by an idea, one that doesn't usually capture the attention of teenaged farm girls. But she had noticed that banks would exchange checks 
for real money. So one day she walked into a small bank in a small town and handed a letter to the manager, who read the words printed on the expensive stationery with official-looking letterhead, which said that she had inherited money from an uncle in England. The money's on its way, she said, and I'll deposit it here at this bank when it arrives. She convinced the unsuspecting bank to give her a checkbook to begin writing checks in advance, which she did all over town, buying the things a young teenage girl buys in the late 19th century. And she'd go from town to town doing this, each time bigger and bolder than the last, oftentimes writing checks for more than the item was priced and receiving cash back from the merchant. It was a common practice at the time. At one point, she even had calling cards printed that identified her as Ms. Bigley, heiress to $15,000. The danger didn't scare her, and several arrests didn't stop her. One of them even went to trial, where she stared off into space, made odd faces and noises at the witnesses, all to convince the judge that she was insane. And it worked. She got away with it, and she was released to her parents' care. 1857 may have been the last year she would use the name Elizabeth Bigley. That year she boarded a train to Cleveland, lived briefly with her newlywed sister and her husband. But when her sister discovered that Elizabeth had attempted to use the young couple's furniture as collateral to secure a loan, they kicked her out. One of the few surviving photos of her from that time show a young woman with a plain oval face, not considered attractive by the standards of the time, dark hair held up in pins, thin lips, a slightly masculine brow. And if you had shown that photo around a certain Cleveland neighborhood, people would have recognized that face as belonging to the woman who married Dr. Wallace Springsteen, a well-publicized marriage that ended just 12 days after it started when the doctor discovered her past and was forced to pay off her debts. But people in Pennsylvania would recognize the face of someone else, a clairvoyant and hypnotist named Marie Rosa, the niece of a Civil War general, a woman who had been very sick and needed money for an operation, which some kind-hearted people lent her and never saw again. In rural Toledo, people would have recognized the face of a woman who married a farmer lived in the area for four years before filing for divorce. And back in Cleveland, another neighborhood this time, people would recognize the picture as the face of Lydia Scott, who would go on to become Lydia Hoover when she married the businessman C.L. Hoover. The two had a son who was sent to live with his grandparents in Canada. Mr. Hoover would die a few years later, leaving her a nice inheritance, just not nice enough, apparently. So she set up shop in town under the name Madame Lydia de Vere, a wildly successful clairvoyant. This was a time in history where belief in hypnotic powers was common, and one of her clients would later claim that she had hypnotized him when she made him an unwitting accomplice in passing bad checks. The pair were arrested and sentenced to nine and a half years in prison in Toledo. She served only four and her parole papers were signed by none other than Ohio's governor and the future 25th president of the United States, William McKinley. She returned to Cleveland, this time under the name Cassie Hoover, where she opened the brothel where she would one day pretend to faint on the floor in front of Dr. Leroy Chadwick. Even the wealth and status she married into weren't enough for her, so in 1902 she hatched her grandest deception. An elaborate con takes elaborate planning. All those lies to keep straight, all those accomplices to keep in check, all those risks and contingencies, so many moving parts. Or maybe not. Maybe all it takes is an understanding of the simplest facets of human nature. Because Cassie Chadwick knew that the best kind of accomplice was one who didn't even know he was in on the con. And sometimes the best way to spread a lie is to ask someone to keep a secret. On a trip alone to New York, she arranged to stay at a posh Fifth Avenue hotel because she knew that James Dillon, a prominent lawyer and family friend, would be staying there as well. It had to seem like a coincidence, a chance run-in, fancy seeing you here, James. 
But as long as you're here, I'm on my way to my father's house. Why don't you escort me? So James Dillon and Cassie Chadwick took a carriage ride to the corner of East 95th Street, and Dillon could hardly believe the house they stopped in front of. A mansion, four stories, a famous house with a famous owner. Cassie got out and asked him to stay behind while she visited her father. Half an hour later, she came back out with an envelope in her hand. She handed Dylan the envelope, which contained a pair of promissory notes worth $750,000 and $5 million in securities, all signed by a man who was definitely good for the money. You see, James, my father is Andrew Carnegie. She told Dylan she had been born out of wedlock that Carnegie routinely gave her large sums of money out of guilt and responsibility, and also to keep her quiet and out of the newspapers, which would have pounced on the story of the steel tycoon having a secret daughter. And she stood to inherit millions when he died, she said. But this has to be our little secret, James. You mustn't tell anyone. Of course, the notes were forged, and the visit to Carnegie's mansion wasn't what it appeared to be. She was let into the house by the housekeeper, who she told that she was there to check on the references of one of their former maids, who they were thinking of hiring. When they got back to Ohio, James Dillon set up a safe deposit box for Cassie's promissory notes. And of course, he shared her secret with just about every lender in Northeast Ohio, just as she knew he would. Bankers didn't hesitate to lend Cassie up to a million dollars, they charged insane interest rates, thinking they were taking advantage. They were in no hurry to be repaid either. Why bother when all that interest was compounding year after year? It all worked so perfectly. Cassie Chadwick had bet on an unspoken rule of high society at the time. Don't speak ill of the rich. And the bet paid off. Nobody would dare ask Carnegie about an illegitimate daughter. Even some of Carnegie's close personal friends lent Chadwick money. And in her new role as an heiress, it seemed that all she did was spend. Shopkeepers would gossip about how she walked into a piano showroom and ordered eight pianos, just like that. The Cleveland social set would marvel at how she took 12 debutantes on a trip to Paris. Visitors to her lavish parties would see her sculptures from the Far East, furniture from Europe, and the curiosities, a gold organ in the living room, a musical chair that played a tune when someone sat on it. She had no rival in her spending. Who else but the Queen of Ohio would spend $100,000 on a single dinner party? And she lived like this for years, amassing massive loan debts. Accounts differ on whether it was two, five, or as high as $20 million and spending the money almost as soon as she got it, despite protests from Dr. Chadwick. One Christmas Eve, while the couple was at a party, she arranged to have their entire house redecorated in the span of a few hours. All of the furniture discarded, all of the portraits and hangings and curios and display pieces, everything gone and replaced by the time she and her husband got back home. One day she walked into the Wade Park Banking Company and spoke to the secretary treasurer. She showed him a promissory note for $500,000. Then she handed him a neatly wrapped package. Inside are stocks and bonds worth five million, she said. Then she asked him to sign a statement of stocks. He never even opened the package. Why would he? Who would ever doubt the Queen of Ohio, the daughter of one of the world's richest men, he gave her a signed receipt for $5 million worth of securities. Securities that, of course, never existed. Only later would he find out that the envelope contained nothing but brown paper. After Wade Park Banking Company, she went to visit Citizens National Bank, where she spoke to the elderly president, showed him the receipt she'd just gotten for $5 million, and told him she needed two men to manage her estate and that she'd pay them each $10,000 a year. The president accepted the offer and volunteered one of his cashiers as the second man. And for a while, she could take out loans from one bank and use them to pay back a loan from another bank. She did this to take out bigger and bigger loans, 
Eventually, she had nearly quarter of a million dollars of Citizens National's money and a hundred thousand dollars of the president's personal savings. But the money soon started drying up, and she needed to find other sources, like Herbert Newton, a Boston investment banker she had been introduced to through a pastor at the local Baptist church, who agreed to lend her almost a hundred ninety thousand dollars. And when he asked for the money back, and Cassie said she couldn't repay, he sued. And that's the moment when Cassie Chadwick's world began to fall apart. Banks in Cleveland sued too, which caused customers at Citizens National to withdraw all of their funds as quickly as they could, and the bank collapsed. But the worst was yet to come in December of 1904, when newspaper reporters started probing into her past as they covered the story of the lawsuit. Within a few days, two women who worked at the Ohio State Penitentiary identified her as the woman who had been imprisoned there under the name of Lydia DeVere. That was enough to set off an international media frenzy. Realizing the walls were closing in, Cassie fled to New York and checked into the same Fifth Avenue hotel where she had met James Dillon, returning to the scene of the crime. She was arrested in her hotel room, and Dr. Chadwick immediately filed for divorce. She was charged with seven counts of conspiracy, including conspiring with the president and the cashier from Citizens National to pass a bank check when they knew that there were no funds to cover it. And of course, by now, word of all of this had reached Andrew Carnegie himself, who issued a statement claiming that he had never heard of Cassie Chadwick. But he showed up at the trial, a trial that the president of Citizens National didn't live to see. Some say he died of a broken heart. A trial that was a two-week media circus, and when it was all over, the jury needed only two hours' deliberation to reach a verdict. The cashier from Citizens National pleaded guilty and served five years. Cassie Chadwick was convicted and sentenced to ten years in prison in Columbus, the same prison where she was incarcerated fourteen years before. The prison where she would die two years later, 30 pounds thinner, blind, comatose, 48 years old, with no friends or family around her, only the prison doctor and hospital attendants. But even in prison, she was able to live in comfort. She managed to get permission to have some of her custom-tailored dresses in her cell, and shoes and furs and furniture and restaurant meals. Even after she was found out and the whole facade burned down, many people still saw her as the Queen of Ohio, and others capitalized on her infamy and colossal nerve. Years after the scandal, a Cleveland drug company did a rousing business selling a product called Cassie Chadwick Nerve Tonic. If you like true stories about imposters and you want to hear more, I've got just the thing for you. Pretend Radio is a podcast about real people pretending to be someone else. Here's the host of Pretend Radio, Javier Leva. Hi, Illusion listeners. I'd like to introduce you to a documentary-style podcast about real people pretending to be someone else. It's called Pretend Radio. It's about con artists, false prophets, and real people who are living a lie, like this man who worked as an FBI undercover agent for 27 years. So what I had to do was a cold approach, which is in undercover cases is the most difficult. So Mahmoud looks at me, but he's still glaring, and he barks some orders in Arabic. So I'm thinking to myself, did Mahmoud just tell him, you know, get the Uzis and pull the van up by the back door? And we learn how one man went from being a small-time street thug to running a multi-million dollar medical scam. He goes, you know the doctor went to jail, right? And I was like, the doctor went to jail? I was like, no, I didn't know that. Why would he go to jail? He said, yeah, man. I called my lawyer and I tell him, hey man, look, I think I got a little problem. He says, what happened? I said, I talked to this guy. He said, the doctor went to jail. I'm pretty sure that if the doctor went to jail, they're gonna probably be looking for me as well. If you like what you heard, subscribe now to Pretend Radio. And follow us on Twitter, pretend underscore radio. Remember, fake it till you make it. Illusion is written and produced by me, Brian Earle. Search for Illusion Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And find show notes, etc. 
at illusionpodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like the show, please tell a friend and leave a rating and review. These are quick and painless ways to show support, and they help the show to grow.